Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is Talcott Parsons, video two. We're going to do three things in this video. First, I want to explore Talcott Parsons' structural functionalism. Next, I want to explore Talcott Parsons on medical sociology relating to the readings you just did. Finally, I want to talk about Talcott Parsons on education before I get you ready to do your two paragraph response. Let's do it. We already spoke about social roles and action in the past video. And we already said they relate in an action system, but what are the properties of action systems? Following Weber and Durkheim, Parsons turns his attention to the general features of action systems. When people call him a structural functionalist, this is a term you'll hear a lot, they refer to the ways that he situates action. In order to continue to exist, any organic whole must be sustained through these four functions. An individual human organism meets these four requirements, you or me, as does a social system like Canadian society. A key Parsonian question. What coordinated components of action systems lets them continue to exist? These are 1. Adaptation, 2. Goal attainment, 3. Integration, and 4. Latency or pattern maintenance. On the slide, you'll see the AGIL system that Parsons introduces in The Social System, published 1951. While before, in the structure of social action, Parsons was trying to distill a theory of action from existing sociology, now he's trying to build a theory of action from the ground up. This applies to any organism that acts. Let's go through the four structural functions in detail. 1. Adaptation. Individuals must adapt themselves to their surroundings. This is so at the cellular level, to that of an individual human, to a society. To persist as such, the system of action must relate and adapt to its environment. A is for adaptation. 2. Goal attainment. Secondly, Parson says, an action system must outline and organize itself according to needs. Problems need to be identified, and decisions need to be made. Information processing and organization happens at the level of perceptions, in living creatures, or in terms of mass decision making, like governments. G is for goal attainment. 3. Integration. In order to function, Components of action systems must combine in particular ways in a consistent and durable manner. That is, they must integrate and remain integrated. For large-scale bureaucracies, people must possess and perform in particular roles. For individual organisms, internal circulation must continue. Rather than simply adapt to an environment, action systems organize components internally to incorporate environmental elements. I is for integration. 4. Latency or pattern maintenance. Think here of codes to be acted through, like language or a shared cultural symbolic system. This we call latency, in the background, not yet realized. It's essential to action, however. L is for latency. What matters for us is that agency and structure are reproduced in all action systems that meet these four requirements. The abstract language here also explains why most sociology undergrads shiver when they hear the word structural functionalism. We can ground the four structural functions in Parsons' medical sociology. Very few people would call themselves structural functionalists today. People are, however, revisiting Parsons' concept of the sick role. As I said earlier, this piece is the consequence of Parsons' observational work in a psychiatric clinic in the 1940s. Parsons is interested in the structure of healthcare and how the social roles within it allow that structure to function. So there are two key roles here, the doctor and the patient. This is early work in the sociology of deviance. Against the backdrop of normal social obligations, sickness is a form of deviance. By this, Parsons means that actors must deviate from their existing social role to adopt the sick role. We have expectations of fathers, mothers, daughters, or professors, and in adopting the sick role, one takes a deviant role instead of one of the others. From the piece, the sick person is, by definition, in some respect, disabled from fulfilling normal social obligations, and the motivations of the sick person in being or staying sick has some reference to this fact. Parsons will say that there are strains on existing social relationships in this transition, and that illness as deviant behavior matches, in terms of structural function, other types of deviance that we can document in society. I must emphasize that the entity here is a social role rather than a single individual organism that happens to be sick. One adopts and is given the sick role, like one adopts and is given the role of a caregiver, albeit in distinct structural conditions. 
With the transition, one incorporates particular obligations and sheds others. My point? We must locate the sick role in the clinical space as an action system. By discussing moral obligations, we're back in Durkheim territory. Here we get a fourfold sketch of these obligations. 1. Freedom. Sort of. The sick person needn't fulfill all the social obligations they had previously. 2. Excuse. If you're sick, you are free from responsibility for your state. Somewhat. 3. Recovery. While one is sick, it is expected you return from this state as soon as possible. 4. Need. The person in the sick role is defined as needing help. Such are the basic moral attachments underpinning the sick role. Now, one can be good at being sick and meet all these attachments quickly and get better, or one can be awful at it. What matters is that in inhabiting this role, we reproduce the social system somewhat or will be corrected by others. Here we should also note that the only criteria that Parsons uses to distinguish what sickness is, is the role criteria. That is, one is placed in a social institution, if not a physical one. He is agnostic about whether or not the symptoms are true, false, or whatever. Mentally ill or not, you have to play the role. Healthcare isn't just about deviance on behalf of the sick person, but also the social role of the healer. Having dealt with the sick role, Parsons turns to the role of the person whose job it is to heal them. Here, as in the sick role, Parsons looks over the differences in technical training needed to qualify as practitioner. What matters is that the role is given to them based on qualification, not the qualifications themselves. In order to maintain this social role in the clinical action system, there are modes of obligation that shape behavior as well. As with the sick role, there are four major points here. The physician's role is 1. Oriented to the welfare of the patient rather than for profiteering, etc. They shouldn't be in this for the money, at least over the well-being of the person in their charge. 2. The psychiatric patient can express to the physician things that would not be possible in other social situations. 3. The therapist is not to reciprocate on fantasies or desires should they be expressed. 4. The physician is ultimately given the power of sanction and support, something needed by the subject of expertise. These aren't secondary to the technical expertise that the doctor has, says Parsons, but rather are primary from a structural functionalist perspective. They relate to the functional prerequisites that the clinical order must have if it is to maintain its coherence as an action system. In short, to continue working at all. We can similarly apply the structural functionalist perspective to the sociology of education. Here, I'm going to explore Parsons' essay, The School Class as a Social System. Parsons applies his theory of sociological systems to the school class and the development of the individual child therein, having read Freud since the mid-1930s. Child development, too, he argues, is subject to the four structural functions. Parsons is interested in how individuals come to occupy social roles, but also how those roles change over time. In the school class, we have the first major socializing agent after the family, and children who attend school encounter social rules and obligations they had not seen before. How do we occupy various social roles as we advance through school? What are the successive obligations and rules placed on us as we do? Here the structure in which action is located is not the entire school, but the traditional school class. You know, kindergarten class, grade 9 science, and so on and so forth. So don't think about education as a whole, but think about the class itself as a social organism. Finally, and this isn't crucial for the theory, but interesting to note, Parson draws all of his conclusions based on a data set of Boston high school boys. Remember, he's at Harvard. Both his medical sociology and his educational sociology draw from his time and place there. Let's look at how social roles change and develop over time in the school class. Here I've drawn up a chart showing you the changes in the social role at work in the classroom in 1959 and the ways that Parsons theorizes them. So, I've selected the teacher role, the goals of the educational enterprise, and notes on sex gender. The teacher's role shifts as a primary caregiver to those in the elementary school system to one that becomes more and more varied. Then, the teacher was almost always a lady, and she was the first universal category children would encounter. Yes, Mrs. Zacharias was my third grade teacher, but I also learned what a teacher was in my interaction. As we progress through to tertiary education, the teacher becomes one in a sea of many. No longer just a caregiver, but more specialized with the education the teacher is supposed to provide. 
This leads to the second mechanism, goals. So, as I said, with the increasing specialization in classes, we also have a shift in the skills taught and learned. Primary education is mostly moral education, learning personal skills. Whereas, as we progress through the system, people are expected to employ more and more specialized skills and there is a hierarchy given, grades. Not only does high school teach skills, but it also allocates students to future paths and supports the division of labor. It puts people into jobs according to capability, says Parsons. Finally, gender. Not only is the school class a skills sorting system, but it is also a gender sorting system, says Parsons. In 1959, it showed the skills men were to learn and women were to learn. It begins with complete social segregation by sex and friend groups. Then, with high school, partner selection begins. Remember the classic high school sweetheart social role. Mixed gender friend groups become more common, as does partnering. And then finally, social roles change in college and university. At the time, most women didn't attend, of course, but with changing social climates, more and more women entered college. And there's no prohibition on the relationships between students and other students, or even faculty. Gross, I know. We've all heard those stories. So, the point of all of this is to show how social systems are adaptive and also how we play the roles that perpetuate them. One can be a good student, or the class clown, or the kid who smells and has a bowl cut and plays too much Nintendo, but we keep the system going. And so too for the teacher role. Remember, it's not an individual, but a finite moral and social role that we occupy. There is a crucial contrast with the sociology of education we've encountered at this point. For Du Bois, inequality in education is something to be eliminated. For Parsons, it is the whole point. We've come a long way. Let's summarize our progress to this point. 1. On action. Sociology is the science of social action. Social roles reproduce social functions. Not theories or social sciences, rather Parsons wants one single science of action systems. 2. On medicine. Medical practice is social action like any other. It displays exactly the same properties of all other action systems and is realized through functional roles. Roles, action, and moral obligation are at work in the art of healing. 3. On education. American society functions both because of and through the education system. The school class is a site of social action, and the structure of action changes within the class. We can chart the development of the human organism with the same set of tools as the educational system as a whole. Now the part you've been waiting for. In two paragraphs, between five to eight sentences in length, one, with reference to the readings, explain how Parsons theorizes the social roles of doctor and patient. Two. Explain how Parsons employs the thought of Durkheim and Weber in doing so.